All right, we've uh, begun recording the webinar. Dr. Daly, if you are ready, I'm going to hand things over to you. Uh, and okay. we can hear you now. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Liam. Thank everyone for joining. I appreciate you taking time to listen to the discussion on Hope and Help for Families. And, and the reason I t entitled this Hope and Help is that there is a lot of focus on the opioid epidemic, which is good because it's making society and medical systems open their eyes to addiction, not just opioid addiction. But most of the focus is on people with problems and not on the family. So we need to do something about that, and I think that uh, that's a responsibility of all of us. And the other thing is we have to instill hope. We have to give hope to families because a lot of families who are affected by severe addictions in particular feel a sense of frustration and hopelessness. So we want to give hope, we want to give help. But what we want to do is set the stage and review some of the trends in substance use and disorders, the impact on the family systems and individual members, including children, briefly review some of the challenges facing people with problems, families and providers in relation to helping families, and then interventions. So the good news is there are interventions to help the families. So let's talk about the trends first, because things change over time. Now, the good news is the majority of people don't use illicit drugs. Only about 10.5% use illicit drugs. If you look at some of the trends, and this is important because you're going to see some changes in the future in terms of what patients or individuals present for treatment. Uh, you're seeing an increase in marijuana use. Uh, you're seeing a decrease in opiate pain pills. Uh, a, a decrease since 2013, but there's still very high rates of using these medications. Cocaine and meth are rising. There, there's more availability. Uh, and, and the heroin is rising. Actually, the 0.5% or half a million, 0.5% is too low. It's actually higher. And then you have a subgroup, uh, 18 to 25, where a quarter of them have used illicit drugs. So there's a risk factor that if you use illicit drugs, you can develop a substance use disorder. Now, even though all the focus recently has been on the opiate epidemic, we have a lot of drinkers, and binge drinkers refer to people that have, uh, men that have five or more drinks on occasion, women four or more drinks, and so we have a lot of binge drinkers, and with a caveat that it can only take one episode of excessive or binge drinking for very negative outcomes to happen as a result of an accident. Uh, or an injury. And then you have about 16 million people who have multiple binge episodes and they're considered heavy drinkers. Then if you look at the young group, age uh, 12 to 20, uh, you have a good number of those who drink and a lot of those who drink go on binges as well. And then you have a lot of heavy drinking. So it cuts across all age groups, but the younger age group, we have to be concerned about them as it being at risk. If you look at disorders, and this is based on the annual study of SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, it's down a little bit from 2015, where it was over 8%. So it's uh, estimated 7.5% currently have a substance use disorder, which is over 20 million. And that doesn't count people that misuse drugs. So these are people that meet clinical criteria for disorder. You also have people that misuse drugs or, or binge drinkers that don't meet criteria, but they, they, they have a problem. For uh, if you take all the all the drugs together, you have about 7.4 million. And if you look at alcohol use disorders, they're over twice as common as drug use disorders, even though most of the focus is on the uh, the drugs. Now, the sad thing about this slide, everyone, is look at the last point below. This is unacceptable. This is a problem. We all have to do something about it. The number of people who receive treatment in the substance use treatment program is less than 11 percent. If you compare this to diabetes or major depressive illness, it's much lower. Uh, medical professionals and individuals are much better at getting people into treatment for psychiatric disorders and medical disorders compared to a substance use problem. So we need to do something about this. The, the other thing about this, too, is that only a few percent think they need, a pro, need help, and that's, the, that's more a manifestation of the disease. You know, I, I have a substance use disorder, but I don't see it. Other people see it. Now, what we know from there's an extensive literature is that there are a lot of adverse effects and I won't go over all these, but any of them can affect families, particularly if you have uh, an overdose uh, or a death. As it could be liver disease, it could be an accident, it could be homicide, suicide, anything. And the other thing is the family unit and the members 
are an increased risk for problems, and we'll go over some of those shortly. And, and then also we have to think of the uh, the unborn. Infants, uh, there is a three- to five-fold increase in infants born with neonatal absence syndrome in the last uh, decade because you have a significant increase in addicted in mothers, pregnant mothers addicted to opiate drugs like heroin or prescription medication. Uh, and the one thing that uh, you, you can look at the different adverse effects, but one of the sad things that uh, impacts on families and individuals is lost potential. You know, I, I've worked with many uh, families who had sons and daughters who flunked out of college or had careers lost. They became so addicted and so and under function, and there's, there's that lost potential. Now, this is a study from Kaiser Permente, which is interesting, and they compared family members that had an adult uh, member with a substance use disorder to others, and what they found is that they're higher uh, rates of different medical conditions. Now, you can't say that the substance use disorder causes these. This, these are correlational. What that means is there's a greater risk for some of these different conditions, and some of this won't be new to you. Like, you know, for example, that depression and, and maybe tension headaches are higher as are substance use problems as well within families. So this speaks to the impact on health. And if you would go to PCPs, I would suspect a lot of PCPs would tell you that they have patients they treat for anxiety or stress or worry, uh, and they're dealing with a family problem related to uh, substance use disorder, mental health, or both. Now, if you think of this in terms of mathematically, if you have 24, 20 million people with a problem and they affect four people, so 80, 80 million people will be affected. If they affect six people, it's 120 million. Now, I come from a family, a, uh, on my father's side, we have severe addiction, multiple generations. So if I took my father's alcoholism, and the good news is he, uh, he got sober at age 66 and died sober at age 80. Um, uh, but if, if you would look at his impact on another person, this is one person, there are probably at least 15 family members and multiple families that he affected adversely by, with his alcoholism. So these numbers are just kind of a guesstimate. Now, a study I did clinically uh, when I managed a large continuum of care, we looked at 140 patients, and these are some of the findings. But I think what, what's most significant about this is the emotional burden is just indescribable. You cannot describe it with data. You cannot describe it with statistics. And the, the burden experience can be uh, anywhere from mild to moderate to severe, but I have spoken with many families who have been just devastated uh, as a result of a loved one's addiction in particular, because you do have different degrees of severity. I mean, you have some people that are less severely affected. They still have a problem, and the adverse effects may not be as much as someone on the other end of the continuum where it's more severe addiction. So the emotional burden. So you can, you're more likely to see a negative family atmosphere, uh, you'll see higher rates of depression or anxiety, and and they they can be uh, they don't necessarily it's not necessarily a psychiatric disorder, but they could be manifestations of a psychiatric disorder. I've seen many spouses over the years uh, when I brought them in to, uh, with the identified addicted patient whose depression was severe enough that they met criteria for disorder and needed some kind of treatment themselves. And the grief is unbearable. And actually, to be honest, there's two types of grief. There's grief of living with an addicted person. And if you look at this uh, definition of addiction, it's enslavement. The addiction controls a person. So oftentimes people feel like they've lost someone to the addiction. And so the grief is significant. And then if they lose someone through death and overdose or other reason, uh, there's another, uh, another form of grief. So uh, there's stress is common. Uh, if uh, one of the sad things is the hopelessness and helplessness. Now, on the other hand, I was in uh, South Carolina at a recovery clinic a couple weeks ago, Faces and Voices of Recovery, and it's an advocacy group, and they have on-site meetings for people with addiction and families, and I participated in a couple of family meetings. And what's really nice is the antidote to some of the hopelessness is recovery for families. If you get recovery, if you get families involved in treatment or mutual support programs or both, you can help them overcome the hopelessness, the guilt, the shame, and all these negative things. Uh, so that's that's the good news. But you're, you're going to see distress, and then one of the things I like, you know, in the past I went to many meetings, Eleanor meetings, 
And if you, if you have lived this, you can understand why someone would do this. So there was a woman that once said, she made a list of 100 ways to kill her husband. Now, someone who doesn't understand addiction would say, this woman's nuts. But really, if you understand addiction from the family point of view, you can understand her frustration. It's just not that she would do that, but it was just letting it out. So you have higher rates of economic instability and poverty, particularly when the mother is the primary uh, uh, person supporting the family. Uh, People are underemployed, uh, lose jobs, moving too much. Uh, I, I know in our family, when I grew up, we were on and off welfare, and I was very ashamed of that. But I lived in a community where most a lot of people were on welfare, which was, you know, when you think about it, it's a little bit crazy. But um, there was still that embarrassment and living from payday to payday, check to check. And then you have severe cases. I, I worked with a woman who had taken over $100,000 out of the IRA, and uh, you know to support her cocaine addiction. Now, so you have the family system can be affected in different ways: how people relate, how they communicate, how they get along, how they spend their time. Uh, but you also have the effects on individuals, and we had mentioned before about uh, the neonatal absence syndrome. Or you can have also children who are born to mothers with alcoholism uh, can have uh, effects as well. But these kids, and I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, all these reports that come out from the government, all these reports that come out from academic institutions, and all these reports that come out from other groups interested in the opiate epidemic, none of them, none of them, maybe one, will even mention children. And, and, and there's a problem with that. Um, a few mention the family, but they don't talk much about the family. I can't tell you the number of reports I read where if you look at this, you think, oh, we have to take care of the people with the addiction, forget all the families. Uh, but these kids are at high risk for all these different problems. Uh, and then if you look at this, it's uh, uh, medical, it's psychiatric, it's academic. So um, these kids deserve attention. And the study of adults before from Kaiser Permente also looked at children. And children who have uh, parents with a substance use disorder have higher rates of these problems here. You know, what stands out is trauma. And, and you, a lot of you know about, uh, you know, the studies of um, uh, ACE. Why am I, forget, why am I uh, blocking with it? Adverse, adverse events, um, the more adverse events you have, the greater likelihood that you can have trauma or psychiatric disorder. So, and, and kids are exposed to different kinds of behaviors on the part of families or, or parents who have an addiction. You might have one child who the parent is sort of quiet in the background. You may have another child who grows up in a family where mom or dad with the addiction is very violent and very unpredictable. Uh, academic problems. Uh, Here's a, you know, we've done a lot of interviews with family members over the years, and here's a young kid, got in trouble with the law, almost dropped out of school, uh, and in some of the studies done with uh, the CEDAR program, uh, Dr. Ralph Tarter at Pitt found that the kids from the families with drug, uh, drug problems had lower IQ scores and school performance. Uh, and, and you know that that can affect your future you know, your possibilities. You also have, you know, these are just some studies that show uh, high rates of uh, <clears throat> kids admitted for psychiatric problems uh, have high rates of parents with a history of a substance use disorder as well. So, and, and kids are not like adults where they can talk about this necessarily. They just may keep it internalized and not say much. Uh, higher rates of abuse and neglect. If you look at child abuse and neglect, uh, child welfare services, uh, this uh, substance use disorders uh, are involved in the majority of cases. His, yeah, so think of this little boy. Dad was never around. I felt lonely. I also felt sorry he couldn't be with us. Imagine what it's like for him. You know, he, he plays baseball. Dad doesn't go to any games. Or plays football. Dad never goes to his games. Or mom never goes to the games. Um, so there's different degrees and types of abuse and neglect, and some of it, and, and we're such a society focused on physical abuse, uh, and sometimes we minimize the impact of psychological abuse and neglect. And recently, because of the opiate epidemic, <clears throat> more kids are going to foster care. And a lot of these uh, kids who are taken out of the home are being placed with relatives like grandparents. I have some friends in recovery 
Uh, I'm a grandfather. I have five grandkids and one on the way, and I love my grandkids. It's it's amazing. It's it's uh, it enriches your life to no end. And I I love doing everything I do with them, but I also love sending them home. And my idea of, of retirement is not raising little kids. And this is what's happening to some grandparents. And then, then you have the whole thing. Uh, you, you know the stats, over 64 million people die from uh, drug overdoses, about 88, uh, 64,000. And uh, over 88,000 die from alcohol-related problems and a half a million from tobacco addiction-related problems. But people are left behind. When someone dies, they leave these loved ones behind. And this is just you know some examples. I went to a vigil at the Bridge to Hope, where we light candles in memory of people we've lost. And this little boy lit one for his father, who died when he was three years old. And I tell you, there was not a dry, uh, not a dry eye in the uh, audience. So what are some of the barriers and challenges we face? One is um, sometimes a client or the patient or individual in recovery, you know, they have great shame and guilt over their behaviors that, or they believe it's my problem. Um, they don't want to get people involved. And, and the way I think about this is if we – if we give people what they want, this is where I think we have to look at how do we persuade and convince someone to let us get their family involved? Because if we wait for them to do it, it probably won't happen. Uh, you know, I ran weekend family programs for years at different places. And if you let the patient uh, contact and engage the family, they're less likely to be engaged as opposed to the staff member or if you have volunteers do it. So we have to we we have to work with clients to overcome these barriers, uh, and that's true with mental health problems too. I have a colleague that uh, took over a mental health program a long time ago, and significantly increased family involvement because he set that expectation. And part of this is in clinics, not so much for individual clinicians or practitioners, is having a philosophy about the family. What's our view of the family? We say it's a family disease, but do we treat it that way? And so, um, so you do have um, you do have a lot of treatments that will address family issues uh, for people with substance use disorders and different individual group therapies, and then you have some models like the matrix models that has a family module, and so these are good things. Um, and you also have marital and family therapies as well, uh, which, which can be very effective. And so the member with the substance problem, what we want to do is help them understand how they've affected the family, including the children. Because sometimes uh, adults think that, well, you know, I, I paid the bills and, you know, I wasn't violent. Uh, you know, I was sort of a quiet alcoholic who didn't raise too much hell, uh, didn't affect the kids too much. Well, that's not true. Uh, we can influence family members to, or people with substance use disorders to encourage their family to get educated, to get involve them in treatment. And what I would do is when I would see someone, you know, I saw one one young faculty member and, you know, his wife was home with little kids and it wasn't always easy to get babysitting, so we would call her into some of the sessions and we would have her some discussions on the phone. You do what you have to to involve the, uh, the family member. Um, I think encouraging uh, attendance at uh, Naranon or Elanon or other family programs. Uh, the 12-step program encourages people with addiction to make amends. And I can tell you that, I can tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people skip that. I think they're brilliant steps and very helpful. And you have to worry about timing, uh, but they can undo a lot of damage. And then the other thing is uh, helping family members with the problem with the substance use disorder uh, do something if they have other members who may have a, a substance problem or a psychiatric disorder who need help. Families have barriers as well. You know, there's, there's a lot of different things that get in the way of families. These are just some of them. I won't go over all of them because you know we have a lot to cover. Um, now, this is the one I would say to you, that, and, and I, you know, I'm a licensed social worker. I've, I've been trained in family therapy in the past. You do not have to be a social worker or family therapist to help a family. You can be a nurse. You can be a case manager. If you talk with them, you, a 10-minute conversation can have an impact, connecting them to a, a treatment program or connecting them to mutual support or getting your client to think about family. So there's a lot of ways you can help directly and indirectly. Uh, and so you, you want to you think about that. 
but what I have found over the years is that uh, a lot of staff from all disciplines, including I've seen this with MDs, I've seen it with PhDs, I've seen it with master level, and I've seen it with social workers too, who just feel like you know we don't know what to do with families. So. Uh, what I would urge you to do is the more conversant you become with the family issues, the more helpful you can be. Now, the good news is uh, if you look at this, you have many studies that will show increased engagement and retention for affected individuals. Uh, the families feel better, their burdens reduced, and people get better, the, uh, the person with the substance use problem, whether it's an adult or a teenager, and their family. So there, there is uh, uh, evidence of effectiveness of different, and there's a number of different uh, interventions uh, on the SAMHSA website. So when you look at the family unit uh, or the members, you want to look at what are you know what are their worries and concerns? What do they need? What it was like for them? You know, do, do you need to connect them to treatment? Do you need to connect them to recovery or both? Um, can you help them engage their loved one who's not in treatment for an opiate addiction or alcohol dependence? Uh, can you help them with self-care? Although self-care comes a little bit later. So let's look at some interventions to help. Let me see if I can. Interventions to help families and members, including children. So you have um, family therapy. And from what I've found, everyone, and some of you may be very good family therapists. I hope there are some on the line. You probably know a lot more than I do. But uh, we don't seem to use family therapy much, uh, which I think is a shame. But these are approaches that try to change the family by getting the system involved. And the system could be any configuration of family members. It could be two parents or one parent and multiple uh, offspring. It could be adults. It could be parents and grandparents. Um, but the idea is to help the family look at how do we support the person with the problem and how do we deal with our own the own impact on us as well. And the impact can be the emotional burden. It could be the financial burden. It could be, you know, what, what are the rules of family members? And so these are just some of the evidence-based models of family therapy. Uh, and so there's literature on each of these. Although I would I would say this, um, as an aside, when I was invited uh, overseas a couple of years ago to do a talk on family treatment at an international conference, um, I looked up, uh, I looked, I looked at um, in the index of major textbooks, and I looked at. Uh, the titles of about 800 studies funded by NIAAA and NIDA, just to, just to see you know how, how much focus on the family, and what I can say is in the textbooks, uh, less than four percent of the pages address family issues, and you might you might be you might get more information on a drug like fentanyl than you will about the family. And as an aside, there was a large conference in Georgia. Uh, they do every year on, on narcotic addiction treatment, and I, I looked at all the um, uh, abstracts of the presentations, and I saw nothing on the family. I mean, maybe some people d dealt with that, but it certainly didn't say it in their abstract. So you do have these models um, that are effective, but I don't think you see these much in practice. And so these are just some of the goals, you know, and the goals are to help the family function better. And uh, now there is a caveat that you will have, there are many cases in which the family is severely disjointed and you may not be able to do much with the family because you have, you know, maybe you're working with a spouse and the other spouse has a, uh, a worse problem and they don't want involved in treatment uh, or you have other family members who are, uh, have severe mental health problems or other issues that get in the way. So, and they can affect the, the person with a substance use disorder. It's reciprocal. It's not like the person with a disorder affects the family and it doesn't happen on the other way. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so these are just some of the goals of family therapy. And the, uh, the uh, one of the reviews of the, the literature, the meta-analysis, it was really interesting. It's, it essentially finds that families do improve, and for adolescents, it's pretty much family therapy is the treatment of choice based on the, the studies in the literature. So those of you who work with adolescents, you probably know that anyways. And so here's one model, and CRAFT is Community Reinforcement uh, Approach with Family Therapy, and the goals are to uh, twofold. One is to get the person in treatment, and typically, if you try to get a family in treatment, 
uh, family try to get people in treatment using the usual approaches, that maybe one in four, 25 percent is successful. If you look at this, it's much higher, 64 to 86 percent success rate. Uh, and then they try to get the member, uh, obviously, to work on the substance use, uh, and they add incentives. But the other thing is, even in cases where the family the person with the addiction or substance problem is not involved, the family can get better and enrich their own life. Now, initially, that's hard for families to embrace because they're there to help their loved one. So if you look at a family engagement, there's a number of models, and these are just three examples. Uh, if you use these interventions, you have much higher rates of engagement. So there are ways of getting people involved. And so you have the ARISE model, which has different levels of interventions. Brief strategic family therapy and the craft model, which I'd mentioned before, and there are, there are treatment manuals that describe and trainings that describe all all of this stuff. If you're interested, and some of you may have been uh, trained in some of these models, uh, my observation is we need more of this in, in our community programs. And for adolescents, I'd mentioned the superior results uh, of family therapy. You know, in terms of the kids, they don't use as much. They improve their behaviors. They improve. Uh, the school performance, the family gets better. Lots of lots of good evidence on this. Uh, and you can also help a family if you don't see the person with the substance use disorder. Um, you can improve how they get along. Uh, you can reduce the conflict. You can improve the structure of the family, who does what, how, how people communicate. But probably the most significant, one of the most significant uh, positive effects is a reduction of those awful feelings that people have when they feel extremely angry and just enraged. I mean, I, I mean, I've seen people that have had sense of hatred, and which really comes out of frustration. I'm reminded, I was at a birthday party of one of my grandkids, a two-year-old, and uh, sat next to an older guy who was telling me about his brother and his brother's nephew who had the um, uh, opiate addiction. And his dad said to his son, said, you know what, I want you to get your social security number tattooed on your arm so when you die, we can identify you. And you can imagine the frustration and the, the, the sadness and the hurt of that father to say that. And so that's a case where the anger is much deep-seated and other emotions related to this. It's just just, just awful. And, and I have um, – I, I know people – who have lost adults to um, the opiate, you know, with opiate addiction. It happens with other problems as well, and it's just awful what they go through. In fact, I wrote an article uh, recently called, if you get the Counselor Magazine, it's called Grief Has No Expiration Date, and I cited a couple mothers who talked about their journey of grief and losing young adult men uh, to overdoses and how, you know, this doesn't go away in three months or six months in one year. So when uh, families get help, they feel better. Um, they improve their financial functioning, uh, and you have you have marital approaches. Uh, and what they do, uh, there's one called behavioral marital therapy or behavioral marital counseling, and there's a number of studies on these approaches, and they show all these improvements here. And they also, and some of these too, uh, with alcohol dependence, where you where a medication is involved, like antabuse or disulfiram, which is an aversive medication. If you drink on it, you get sick. So the idea is that if you have a desire for alcohol, you know, you'll put off drinking because it'll stay in your system 7 to 14 days. That the person, the, the spouse with the alcohol dependence, would take the medicine in front of the other person. So there is some accountability. So this is another treatment that's effective as well. So. Here are some strategies. Some of this we mentioned. There'll be some repeat. So we want to work with people on the impact on the family. You know, what do you think it was like for your uh, your teenage daughter? What do you think it was like for your nine year old son? You know, even if you never see the the child, or you know, maybe uh, may, maybe the parent is no longer living with the family, or, or even living with the parents. You know, what it was it like for your mother and father? Uh, education is important. Families benefit from learning about uh, addiction in particular as a brain disease as opposed to bad behavior. It helps reduce some of the stigma. And as you know, there's a great stigma related to these problems, more so than any other kind of uh, condition. Uh, and as an aside, uh, Columbia University did a major study and review of the literature a couple of years ago, and they found that 
the majority of people um, referred for treatment came from the criminal justice system, that uh, professionals only referred about 6% of the people. And I think a lot of that had to do with stigma and ignorance and what I call addiction illiteracy. So the more you can help others learn about addiction, you can help uh, influence them indirectly in their work with patients or families. Uh, so meeting with uh, individual family members, it could be a spouse, it could be an adult son, it could be a kid. Uh, facilitating groups, you know, I've been in, involved with uh, family education groups uh, for many years in the past uh, from doing two-hour groups on a Saturday or an evening to doing a full Saturday once a month to doing a Saturday and Sunday. In fact, when we did the weekend program, from year one to year two, we increased our attendance from an average of 18 in year one to 42 in year two. Uh, and I remember once having a group of 92 people, which is a little bit big. But uh, uh, So there's a lot you can do in terms of education. Uh, and the more people get educated, the better decisions they can make. And I'm, I recall an elderly woman uh, in her 70s who was uh, always bailing her 40-some-year-old son out of trouble, paying his rent, cleaning his apartment, giving him money. And the, uh, we had a support group for families, and she kept coming back, and they kept suggesting, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. Well, she did, and then she finally decided not to do it. And at that point, her son made a decision to get help and get treatment. So she was able to influence him by changing her behavior. Uh, so providing programs or therapy or linking people with therapy, I think that's important as well. And what I typically did, if I have a, an adult with a substance problem and they have a spouse or whoever their significant others, I would get their permission and bring them in. Even if it's for a session or two, you know, you can learn a lot. And the other thing is I think of Bob Ackerman. Some of you know Bob Ackerman, who just recently retired, who did brilliant work and uh, uh, advocating about the uh, influence or the uh, effect on children, and, and Bob always has great titles, but one of his books was called Same House, Different Home, and I recall seeing a, uh, a father who had a psychiatric illness and very severe addiction with his 14-year-old uh, daughter and 10-year-old son, and the daughter was charismatic, she was had joy de vivre, she was athletic, she was a good student, and she was very resilient. The son was a mess. The son was sad, depressed, low self-esteem. So you can have the same family, but you can have different effects. And, and there's a lot of factors that contribute to that. Um, understanding and accepting the problem, supporting the, the person with the addiction. Uh, and then there's an adjustment to sobriety. Uh, I, had a, I had a woman uh, actually in a family session uh, say to her husband that she liked him better when he was drinking. And, you know, that's not a great incentive to influence him. But also dealing with lapses and relapses so that people understand that this can happen and it's an issue to address, not a reason to give up hope. And one of the problems sometimes in early recovery of family members is that their, their emotions go up and down based on how their loved one is doing. And to be honest, they eventually have to reach a point where uh, how they feel is based on what they do, not what their loved one does. Uh, but that's hard, especially if the person's living with you. You know, if you're a, uh, uh, you have an adult son or daughter with you, and they're still using and still getting into trouble because of their addiction. Family safety is important, especially for children. Um, helping other members get help. So you know, if you work with a spouse and you find out that. You know, their 10-year-old is depressed or their 13-year-old daughter is uh, talking about suicide. You know, you want to get them to uh, look at how can we help this this child get the help they need. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I apologize for using the term enabling. I decided I don't like that term anymore. But what we usually mean by that is people do things with good intentions, but what it does is it perpetuates the problem. So I bail someone out of trouble. Uh, I remember telling my mother to... My mother asked me uh, years ago before she died, can we help my brother who is in deep legal trouble? And my initial uh, uh, response was, yeah, let's let's post bail for him. But to be honest, uh, prison saved him. He actually got into treatment after he left prison. So I think it's important uh, for if you're in a clinic or a program or a hospital rehab to have a philosophy of care for families, understand their experience, 
And what we have to be careful of, and I learned this when I went to Hazleton when I decided I stayed away from the ejection field because of my own personal family history. And then when I got involved, I decided I better go learn something. And I remember Dr. Daniel Anderson, who's the founder of Hazleton, talked about the importance of a family philosophy of care and not to label the families. You don't call them dysfunctional, don't call them sick, don't call them codependent. And the other thing I learned, too, is that we have to outreach the families. We have to invite them. We have to call them. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're working with a client with an addiction, you have to get their written permission. But most will give it to you. Uh, depending on how you deal with them. But the outreach is very important. Um, we want to join with the family. We're part of the team. We had mentioned outreach. I mentioned about the uh, labeling. And uh, we also have to be patient, flexible, and accessible. If you want to work with families who have been affected by substance use disorders, it's hard to do at nine to five. If you're part of an addiction clinic, the idea would be to have some weekend hours or some uh, some, some evening hours or uh, maybe some weekend programming. We've we've done bo both, and both can work. Weekend weekends are um, easier in some ways because people don't have to work, and it may be easy to get childcare that day. And when the, I was in one program, we allowed people to bring children seven years of age or older, and we actually had one of our nurses meet with the younger kids and do some artwork with them. But the flexibility is important, you know, helping them access care. And so these are just, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, there's uh, literature that is um, published by the National Institute, uh, or I'm sorry, SAMHSA, I believe, uh, and what they focus on is reducing the emotional chaos and burden of family mem families and members. Now, in uh, years ago, when I was at, I spent 30 years at Western Psych. Uh, I was chief of addiction medicine for about 15 years, and then I ran a large research center. But my colleagues there uh, were involved in treatment of mental health problems, and uh, when they were treating in the early years of treating recurrent major depression, which is a very common problem, about 50% of people who have an episode of major depression have a recurrence. And then if you have a second recurrence, the rate of another one is 70%. If you have a third, it's 90%. So at least half the people with the depression have a recurrence. So that's a, that impacts not just the person with the depression, but it impacts the family as well. And so David Cuffer, who was the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and was a major researcher on mood disorders, he asked Carol Anderson, uh, who was a friend and colleague and had written a lot of books about family therapy. In fact, one she wrote in the 80s called Mastering Resistance is just as applicable today. And they developed family interventions for families, and they uh, had different phases of involvement. But what they found is that when you engage the families who have mood disorders, and I think this is true of uh, substance use disorders as well, you can help them reduce some of this emotional burden um, because it's just indescribable, just indescribable. Uh, the anxiety can be very high, you know, because you're worried about uh, are they going to relapse? You know, if they're in recovery, are they going to relapse? Uh, and I, when I was in the uh, South Carolina a couple weeks ago at the recovery center I'd mentioned, uh, there was a woman in recovery, a mother, who talked about uh, she and her husband were so worried about her son, they they decided uh, they would take turns sitting in a chair outside of his room so that, they, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't leave the house. Now, of course, you can't sit on the chair all day long, and, you know, you have to go to the bathroom. You know, they went to the bathroom, and he snuck out. Um, but their intention was good. Their intention was to help their son. But uh, what we can do as family members, we can do crazy things. Um, the resentment, the guilt and shame, uh, there's something wrong with my family. I can tell you, having grown up in an alcoholic family, I thought that, you know, we weren't as good as other people. Um, I didn't like to bring anyone home. Uh, but I think what's real common, is, I would mentioned before, is the grief, the, the grief of losing the person to the addiction or the grief of losing someone who, who actually dies, uh, and people need help with that. That's a big issue. Um, and there's a lot of negativity, and it's out of frustration, but if we can help people 
be less negative in their interactions. And it's interesting because, and there are some parallels, I think, in the treatment of mental disorders. And there's a significant literature on what's called expressed emotion. And uh, what this refers to is that with the more severe disorders, like major mood disorders, like bipolar illness, or psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, and, and the schizophrenia has had the more studies than uh, mood disorders, but there have been sufficient dis studies. There have been a lot of studies of expressed emotion. And what it refers to is a couple um, patterns of behavior. One is uh, if you're too negative or hostile or you're too involved, you're like overprotective and you overfunction, what they found is that the, rate, the rates of uh, psychiatric recurrence and returning to the hospital were twice as high. Uh, and so if you think about that uh, in relation to addiction, uh, if, you, uh, if you get too negative, you'll just push people away. And certainly families do that because they're upset and they're worried. And they, you know, they have good intentions. Um, helping families solve, you know, what are some of the current problems? It may be with the kids, it may be with living situation. Uh, increase, uh, family rituals are important, positive interactions are important. Um, in some of the family models, the, uh, the couples treatment, the behavioral uh, therapy f uh, for couples, what they focus on is catch your spouse doing something nice. So instead of criticizing them all the time, uh, start focusing on what do you see good? What have they done that you appreciate? You know, and it can be small things. It doesn't have to be something significant or major but sharing more positive uh, verbal uh, remarks. Um, focus on, the, uh, and this, this is very hard. What we find in a lot of uh, treatment sessions, and you see this in mutual support when people first go, is I'm there to help my loved ones, so what do I do? Uh, people want to know what, what can I do to help them? And, and that's certainly understandable. Um, but at some point, we have to start looking at what do we do about ourselves? Because people ignore their own needs. They ignore their own issues. Uh, and if you look at uh, some of the emotional burden I had mentioned before, you know, whether it's anxiety or depression or guilt or shame, you know, what do I do with that? Or, and, you know, and I'm thinking, too, I, I, had, uh, I had something really good happen to me in the past year is I reconnected with some cousins that I hadn't seen in 50 years. That tells you I'm an old dude. Uh, and it was really nice. So, you know, I've had dinner and I've met with them a couple times. We've, you know, I follow them on Facebook or we chat by phone on occasion. And uh, one of the adverse effects of addiction in my family growing up is that on my mother's side, where no one was addicted, uh, they were so despondent about seeing what my mother went through with her husband who had severe alcoholism that they pretty much had minimal contact with her, which meant that we as cousins had minimal contact with our aunt and uncle and our cousins. And, I, you know, you, I can't fault them for that. But you never hear, you know, you don't read about that much in the literature. You don't hear much about that. But you have these extended family relationships that can be affected. Uh, so one of the good things about recovery is you, you can regain some of this. And what, what I've seen, which has just been remarkable to me, uh, and I was at a couple of family meetings when I went down to uh, the program in South, Car South Carolina, is that uh, it's no different than people with addiction in 12-step programs where they, um, they help each other out. You have family members, uh, many who have been in recovery for years and years, who are actually sponsoring other people or helping other people. Not, not all mutual support programs have what's called sponsors, but uh, many of them do things for others where they mentor people who are new to the program. And it's amazing what people get. And, and uh, the, the one meeting I went to, the woman was new and she was broke into tears and she was saying all this awful stuff that happened. And people understood that and people gave her hugs and afterwards, you know, they, they went out for coffee together and there's all kinds of sources of support you can get from other people. And, and I know when I work with patients or families and we talk about the 12 steps, I always refer to what is step one, what is the first word in step one, which is we versus high versus I. Now, what's very common with families 
is that we try to do it on our own sometimes. We want to solve this on our own. We don't want to reach out for help and support. And in fact, that's true of patients. And it's even more true for professionals. If I ask you all, how important is it for people with problems to reach out for help and support? You would all agree. But if I ask you how many of you do it in your own life, 60 or 70 percent would say you don't. You know, so we often want people to do things we don't want to do. But I can't stress enough the importance and helpfulness of social support. It is so important. And I think that's true of recovery from, it can be recovery from cancer. It can be recovery from grief from any loss, whether it's addiction, mental illness, or medical condition. It can be recovery from mental illness or recovery from a substance use disorder addiction. The social support for the person with the problem, but also for the family member as well, <clears throat> not to do it alone. So, and then I think too, um, helping people understand what are some of the challenges of recovery? Because sometimes what you have with families, and you have it with patients too, the, what I call the honeymoon effect. You know, someone gets in treatment and for the first time and the family, oh, that's great, they're in treatment, they think everything's going to be wonderful. And they come home and they relapse in four months or eight months or 13 months or six days. And the family's devastated, like, how could you do this? Um, uh, but a big part of it is uh, looking at oneself and what can I do to help myself? And part of that is just the normal self-care thing. You take care of yourself. Get, you know, you need sleep. You need rest. You need good nutrition. You need exercise. You need connections for other people. Uh, and I've had to counsel people many times to, you know, reconnect with friends or extended family members or go do things socially. Don't stay home all the time. Then the last thing I wanted to mention is the children, um, that we have to understand that children don't express things in the same way as adults, especially the younger children. And I'm, uh, that's alarm, so I know I'm down to a couple minutes. Uh, St. Francis Medical System Center here at the CAPERS program years ago, and I have on videotape, uh, Nancy Sarasso ran it. It was uh, just remarkable what she did with the kids. And she used art. And I have these pictures of the kids, these kids drew these different art, art, uh, art pictures based on their experiences, and they would talk about it. It was just a way of sharing their emotions. It is very powerful, very powerful. But kids will have these adverse effects. They need help in talking about the concerns. And if you're a mental health clinician and you're working with a 12-year-old or 18-year-old or a 9-year-old or 7-year-old and they're in a the family, you know, uh, where you know there's an addiction, talk to the child about this. We have to protect children from certain behaviors like the violence and the high-risk behaviors, intoxication. Uh, we have to promote family togetherness. That's real important. Uh, I can't tell you how many cases I've had where people, families, have said, "Gee, I'm glad, I'm glad my loved one's in treatment." But guess what? We didn't, we didn't see him or her when they were using, and we don't see him or her now because everything's recovery. So you have to balance recovery with family, uh, and that's not easy to do, especially at first. Uh, and kids need some. They need normal stuff at home, normal family rituals. Uh, you have to be, you have to show interest in what they're doing. Uh, when possible, if you're working with an adult, and this would be an example, let's say you have someone, let's say you're an outpatient clinician and you're working with someone with whatever the substance use disorder is. So let's say they're a 38-year-old married person and they have a spouse and they have a couple kids. Well, there's no reason you can't have them bring in the kids or bring in the spouse and just talk with them, get their input on how things are going and what it was like for them. Um, you know, you want to prepare your patient for this because uh, they may not want to, they may hear things that upset them. And then this is very important. Now go back to the slide that summarized the adverse effects on children that you have higher rates of anxiety, higher rates of depression or a combination, higher rates of oppositional disorders, high rates of substance use problems, academic problems. There are going to be kids who need help. That uh, Now, the interestingly enough, some of the Kaiser Permente studies show that when the person with the addiction does better after a period of time, there are some improvements with the family. But, <coughs> excuse me, if a child has a serious problem, then, you know, you want to get them help. 
So what I would say is um, there's a lot of things that we can do, but we have to to help families, but we have to be open and we have to think about this. We have to think family, just not patient, because I don't know of any single person with a substance use disorder who hasn't affected at least one or several other family members, even if they're no longer connected with them, they have affected others. And you will see these folks in mental health clinics. You will see these folks in addiction clinics. And, and I, I've seen people, I remember uh, a couple people participating in my weekend programs as family members who had been involved in recovery from their own addiction, and they saw it differently, and they were just flabbergasted. Oh, my God, I can't believe this. Uh, but the good news is uh, I think we can help families uh, do a better job engaging their loved ones in treatment because keep in mind we only have 10 or 11% who get help. We need to raise that. So we do that with the families because they're the ones mostly involved. Uh, we can help families as units or we can help individual members uh, with our professional uh, services as well as the linkages as well. And Western, and I think, I hope I sent to, I read a, uh, I think I did. If not, I'll send it to him. We have a nice resource list uh, of uh, uh, federal, state, uh, local uh, mutual support and family resources. I think we have about 12 or 14 uh, excellent family resources that you can uh, access. And some of these are just informational resources, but some of them are also uh, mutual support programs. So uh, I thank you for your participation. I hope this has been informative. What I would just urge you to do is pay attention the next time you get a brochure in the mail to a conference on the opioid epidemic or something about addiction and see if there's anything about families. Pay attention if you get a journal and they write about or you see an article about uh, opiate addiction or some other addiction or cocaine addiction. Are they saying anything about the families or children? And then make sure you do what you can to help families and children. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Daly. Uh, I think think I can say we all enjoyed it. And um, we have a few questions that have come in uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, if you have a few minutes, I'd love to read a couple of them. I have all the minutes. You all the yeah, sure. All right. <laughs> And um, to our participants, if you have a question that you haven't been able to submit yet in either the chat or the Q&A box, mm -hmm. uh, you still absolutely have a chance. And if we don't get to them in the next few minutes, um, I can still pass them along to Dr. Daly and uh, <clears throat> see if he has anything for you. So first of all, uh, one of our participants asked, what are your thoughts around the legalization of marijuana and patients <laughs> even more downplaying their use of marijuana because of this? Okay, so this is my opinion. And I just read a report of, uh, that was actually uh, reviewed by faculty from Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and some of the leading research institutions in the country, the five states with legalized marijuana. Personally, I'm against it. Uh, and the evidence points to the fact that uh, states that have legalized marijuana have higher rates of marijuana dependence, higher rates of uh, driving under the influence of marijuana and accidents, higher rates of using medical resources. Uh, because in, the other thing you want to keep in mind is the young people, uh, people 25 and younger, their brains are still developing. So if they're using marijuana, that's going to have an adverse effect on brain development. So my personal opinion, and I, I used marijuana as a young person. If, if you won't believe this, I worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. I was on midnight shift, and we used to go out at 3 o'clock in the morning and smoke and go back. And I'd go back paranoid as hell. Um, but uh, I, no, I, I would say, in my opinion, um, uh, I'm not. I'm not for legalization, uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with. Uh, I'm. I'm for decriminalizing, and so people don't end up in prison for getting caught with some. Um, but I think it causes more harm than good. Now, having said that, you're always going to have people. Keep in mind, uh, if you remember the the slides with the data, that's the most commonly used and misused drug in our country, and uh, the rates are going up. So you're going to see more people in treatment because I, even with the medical marijuana, you have 17 conditions improved in Pennsylvania, and there's only uh, strong scientific evidence for three of those conditions. A lot of it has to do with money and revenue. 
uh, I believe. So, uh, but if the marijuana smokers who smoke regularly, uh, about 40% of them get addicted. So uh, there's a difference between someone who smokes on occasion and someone who smokes regularly. And you're going to have a lot of a lot of both, just like drinkers. You know, you have some people that drink a little bit, and some people who drink too much. But that's a great question. A great question. All right, thank you very much. And I also just wanted to let you know that uh, we can see your email inbox right now, just in case oh. you would rather <laughs> rather minimize uh, that. Up to you. Um, my slide. Okay. Good thing I wasn't. <laughs> Sending a message to my wife that hey, what are you cooking me for dinner tonight? You know. Oh no, they they all look dumb, very professional. But uh, we have a couple more questions. Someone has asked, should there be separate and unique interventions for parents slash family members of young adult substance users versus those with adolescent slash child substance users? Uh, yes and no. There, there are certain interventions. When you talk about stuff like uh, family education support, uh, that can be for anyone. But there may be things you do different with parents of teenagers than you do with parents with adult kids. So I, I think that's a very valid question. And that's no different than uh, any time you, know, you use a treatment. You know, if you're using dialectical behavior therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, you have to adapt it to the patient and the circumstances in which you're working. And I think the same holds true with the, uh, with the family. Now, that's a good question because I will also tell you, one of the groups I think that has ignored, one of the family groups, has been parents and grandparents. There's not a whole lot out on them. And that, that's, a, that's a shame. And I think I forgot to mention when I uh, said about reviewing the indexes of major textbooks on addiction and the studies, less than 2% of the studies had anything about families and children in the title. That doesn't mean that any of the studies didn't deal with that, um, but I can tell you that there's not much going on. I got a, a note from a friend that was involved in NIDA's Clinical Trials Network for 11 years, and so now they're finally talking about maybe doing some family studies. So, um, so that's a good question. All right, thank you for that information. Um, I've got one more question here at the moment, which is, um, what recommendations can you provide for including families of court-mandated clients who are generally more resistant to treatment in the first place? Well, you know what? If they're court-mandated, you have leverage. I would use that leverage. Um, and, and to be honest, if you go back to the comment I made about the um, reasons people get into treatment, the majority of referrals come from the criminal justice system. If it were not for the criminal justice system, the drug and alcohol programs, licensed programs would have to shut down. Um, I don't think that should matter. If people are mandated, try to get the families in if you can. Now, what you may find is that in some, you know, you're, you may find families that have parents who are involved in criminal justice systems, so you have different kinds of dynamic, but uh, that doesn't mean that you can't bring them into family programming or family sessions as well. All right, thank you very much. And um, th this is actually a little more of a comment than a question, but I feel like you might still have an answer. Uh, one of our viewers has said, my son is 27 and still suffers anger issues from my SUD. While he is successful in his career, he often reflects back to his childhood and gets angry about the neglect of not spending time at school activities, et cetera. Yeah, that's, I, I feel bad for you because, you know, obviously you know, you've done something to help you. I, I think a couple things. One is uh, it takes patience, it takes love, it takes tolerance, um, it takes discussions, and, and maybe uh, he may need to participate in therapy for himself. He may need to go to a mutual support program to work through some of this. Because the other thing is, people can become resilient and overcome this. But, uh, you know, listen, I'm 67, and I probably, it probably took me to my 30s to figure out how to deal with the uh, all the anger I had towards my father for his alcoholism. Um, and uh, so we're, we're all different in how we hold on to that, but we, we have to let it go. And there's no easy solution. We have to learn to forgive. And we forgive for ourselves, not for the other person. Uh, but we may need support from others. We may need support from a therapist. We need, need support from a mutual support program. 
Um, but I wish you well in your recovery, and I, I feel bad. But that's one of the ugly side effects um, that some people hold on to this. Uh, I, I just wrote about a case where you had two people from the same family. Uh, you know, these are men in their 30s, and one's doing fine, and the other one's like still pissed off, as you can imagine, you know, because of what he, what his dad didn't do. And what I had to do with my father, because I played all kinds of sports. Um, I did all, you know, we he had all kinds of uh, games and school activities. He never came to anything, never came to my wedding, never came, you know, when my children were born, never came to the hospital. Uh, so I had, a, you know, a lot of things I was upset about. Um, so I, you know, when when I learned more about addiction and learned to forgive, it was easier to go on and not let that drag me down. But I, I know how that feels from the point of view of a, a member, family member affected. And it, it's, trust me, it's ugly. Uh, you know, I wish there were an easy solution, but there's not. Well, thank you all for your great questions. And thank you, Dr. Daly, for such a great webinar. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Okay. So at this time, I'm going to quickly go over our evaluation and CEU instructions for those who are interested. Um, you will receive a few emails from us following this webinar. In this email, there will be a link to a recording of the webinar, uh, which may not arrive for a couple days, as well as a PDF version of Dr. Daly's slides. You will also receive in the emails a link to the evaluation, which we encourage you to complete. Uh, completion of this evaluation is critical to maintain and continue to provide quality education and materials. Your participation is so appreciated and the evaluation should not take more than two minutes of your time. Immediately following the evaluation is a request form for a certificate of attendance or NADAC slash PCB CEUs. Should you choose to skip the evaluation and proceed directly to the CEU request, leave all the answers blank on the evaluation. One last time, we want to thank you for your participation today. And if you have any questions, please email us at info at That's I-N-F-O 